conceptualize and overgeneralize anxiety. For Nancy, always the offbeat thinker made the trauma of breathing not the individual experience of the trauma of birth, but rather a phylogenetic question of our emerging from the sea onto land, where we were forced to learn to breathe and engage in the violence and impossible constraints of sexual reproduction. Ferenczi, following Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle, explicitly links um, the, the, the question of asthma to the death drive in a very revealing title text, The Unwelcome Child and His Death Instinct from 1929. In that text, he calls an aversion to life or dry diffusion manifest in a variety of self-destructive forms, asthma being one of them. In his analysis, he picked up on this patient's unconscious awareness of signs of having been unwanted or unwelcome, namely an intergenerational transmission of their parents' death right. All we will see very soon in the film Pieces of a Woman, where the intergenerational transmission of trauma that marks the sudden death of a newborn baby who stopped breathing stops when the bereaved daughter takes a stand in court, declaring that survival is not at all cost. And let's see the clip and then we could maybe make a comment about it. So that will be our first clip. Sarah, if you could please show us the, the, the clip of the film. It will be a minute. Can we share the screen? Compensated, and I can't. When I go back. We, we need, yeah, need to rewind. I can't bring her in. For what happened, but we are not going to find it here in this room. I can't see it, Sarah. And if I stand here and ask for... Bear with us. Look at it. We had it earlier. <laughs> we need we need to go rewind to the beginning. <laughs> rewind. Go, go back. I can see it. <laughs> so old school. <laughs> so old school. <laughs> if I stand here and ask for oh, come on. compensation or money, then I am, I am saying that I can be compensated and I can't. I can't bring her back. No money or verdicts or sentences can, can Sarah, bring can you see this? I can see it. I can see it too. You can see it. Okay, good. I can see it. How can I give this pain to someone else? Someone who has already suffered. And I know she would not want that. At all. That is not why my daughter came into this world. By the time that she did. So, in Pieces of a Woman, what we see in this small clip, I hope you, you were able, you were able to see it, uh, that uh, the intergenerational and transmission of trauma is uh, marked by the sudden death of a newborn baby. The baby stops breathing after uh, being born turns blue and dies. And, uh, and uh, when the bereaved daughter is what we see on the screens, takes a stand in court, she's declaring that survival is not at all cost. Retribution cannot take away her loss and that she will not continue to persecute the midwife as her mother wanted to do following her own experience of Holocaust. So there is a, a standpoint where she ends the cycle of repetition uh, and, and we see her with, suddenly with a smile in this very tragic moment when she makes this declaration in court, uh, an encounter between a history of trauma and in the intervention of the law, literalized in the courtroom, and uh, the issue that how this breath and breath that stops in a sudden and inexplicable and impossible to account for way uh, is, is metaphorized a turn in the family history, the saying the ate, as, as Lacan would call it. Yeah, there's also something interesting. All the films that we'll show today have this quality of um, having 
one person on one side of the field and, and, and another person or other people's on the other side as if it's already bringing the screen into the movie itself. So you'll see that in the other clips that we show. Um, Winnicott, in fact, comes to very similar conclusions as Ferenzi observing an infant's asthma at the point of hesitation in relation to oral gratification. The infant via asthma, he says, tests his fantasy against reality and tries to find a reassuring response. A response that would say to the baby, you can give and take without fear or reprisal. For Winnicott, what's important psychoanalytically is to help a child play again, play again, to take and use the object at the point of anxiety and inhibition. In fact, this play between breathing, anxiety, and desire, you can see in the movie Safe and is already in Freud. We're gonna play you something from Safe in a minute. Freud, in a love letter to his future wife, Martha, aligns healthy breathing with desire. He writes, when the breath comes short, interest narrows and the heart abandons all desire. Around that time, Freud also gave the example of respiratory preoccupation in the case of obsessional thinking about the body. Quote, a woman suffered from attacks of obsessional brooding and speculating. This obsession, which ceased only when she was ill, then gave way to hypochondriacal fears. The theme of her worry was always a part or function of her body, for example, respiration. Why must I breathe? Suppose I didn't want to breathe, etc. Breathing here becomes an ambivalent erotic object. This is a theme that we see in Todd Haynes' movie, Safe. Um, and maybe we can play the clip yeah. and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Can everybody see that? Yep, yep. The sound, I'm not sure you. Who are you? My name is Carol White, and I live in Southern California. Sorry, I'm going to play that clip again, but just to remind everybody, if you could turn the volume up as high as possible on your own um, devices, and I'll just start this again. Who are you? My name is Carol White. And I live in Southern California. Oh my God. Um, I'm a, a homemaker. I'm, I'm working on some designs for our house though, mm -hmm. in my spare time. Ghost. Suddenly, I find myself feeling sick. Fatigue and depression turn to migraines, blackouts, even seizures. Now, if this sounds familiar, you are not alone. created us, we are safe, and all is well in our world. Oh, 
and I think it's slowly opening up now. People's minds, like um, educating and and AIDS and um, and other types of diseases, because because and it is a disease, because it's out there, and we just have to be more aware of it, and make like, people aware of it, and um, even ourselves, like uh, going reading labels and, and going into buildings. Lester, he's just very, very afraid. Afraid to eat, afraid to breathe. But let's talk about you. We really need to be hearing from you. What's going on in you? Um, if you haven't seen the movie, you have to watch it. I mean, even watching it right now was so uncanny. I mean, even to see people in masks and obviously the movie's <laughs> quite a ways back. Um, but the question in the movie is that the more that these people who end up kind of in a, in a commune, try to make them feel, feel safe, um, try to find safety in an environment that they're finding very hostile, the more and more anxious and fragile um, that they become. And it becomes this kind of American allegory and horror story. Um, Carol's panic attacks are triggered by her dealing with the object. In fact, you see that amazing scene where she has the child on her lap um, and she starts to be able to, un she starts to be able not to breathe and the child leaves and she completely collapses. And there's something interesting there about the presence of the object. And when it disappears, for example, also when she's driving her car in the circle, it's as if the circuit of the drive can't find an object. Um, while choking, it's Claire then who becomes the object and then who falls from the scene. And she falls further and further and further out of society. Khan mm -hmm. mentions breathing after introducing the object in psychoanalysis as what commemorates loss. He observes that the erogenous zones in the body are sexualized and that their importance goes beyond organic function. Food ingestion involves other organs, for example, besides the mouth. Erogenous zones appear in the body as the result of a cut. They take advantage of the borders of the body and of orifices, but most importantly, they're connected to areas of exchange and connection. The closing and opening following the pulsating rhythm of partial drives is also the rhythm of the unconscious. Without elaborating further, Lacan actually mentions respiratory erogeneity, commenting that it has been little studied, but is very important because it's through spasms that it comes into play. The spasm, of course, is related to another uncontrolled muscle movement, the orgasm, often listened to as children in, in the form of the heavy, heavy rhythmic breathing of parents' sexuality. Lacan points out that in order to listen, one often also holds one's breath. So one question we may pose is, is respiratory erogeneity a neglected zone in the unconscious libidinal economy? Then what is the object of the respiratory drive? 
Is it simply air? Air appears always mediated, the production of an exchange that is not necessarily with another human being. In the case of asthma, air is in the audible manifestations created by the spasms that take the form of choking and whistling. The action involved in the respiratory drive is inspiration and exhalation. The cut in the erogenous zone is centered on the hollow of the lungs where a point between inhalation and exhalation takes place. Something that can be placed by a spasm and whose reflexive forms appears mostly as choking. In the context of the United States, where a black person can incarnate the object A, their breathing itself became what has always been attacked and destroyed from lynching to police brutality. And here we would like to share with you our last clip today is uh, from Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing, that is so uncanny today in retrospect, foreshadowing the recent Recent outbreak of protests following the death of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. The scene as Hello, we everyone. this movie is very instructive. So please, Sarah, if you could share the last clip. Sure. This is Spike Lee, the producer, writer, director of Do the Right Thing. This past June was the 30th anniversary of this film. I know the column is called Anatomy of the Scene. I'm renaming this. I'm calling this anatomy of a murder. The chokehold of Ray Rahim, played by the late great Bill Nunn, my Morehouse brother, was based upon the death of Michael Stewart. September 1983, Michael Stewart, graffiti artist, he's about as big as I am. 11 New York City Transit Police jumped on him and strangled our brother to death. That's where I got the idea for the chokehold murder of Ray Rahim. And five years ago, Eric Gardner died the same way that Ray Rahim did in a movie, but was based upon the real life chokehold of Michael Stewart. So a lot of things in this film that even though it was written 31 years ago, are still happening today. Black and brown people are still being murdered today by police forces across the United States of America and the people who inflict this death walk free. Don't get fired, don't get suspended. The film takes place one day, the hottest day of the summer in the People's Republic of Brooklyn, New York. So tensions have risen all throughout the day. And the reason why it looks the way it is, because the edict, the command to Ernest, the DP, the Wynn Thomas, the production designer, Ruth Carter, the council designer, here's what I told him. I said, look, I want people to be sweating in an air conditioning theater when they see this film. And what we want to do is after he destroys the boombox, it's quiet, like the calm before a storm. Everybody's like, what's next? Everybody knows it's going to be bad. Everybody's looking around. Rahim. I mean, that was personal. It's like he got beat with the baseball bat because you've seen him the whole film with his boombox blasting public enemies fight the power. We did not have a very good stunt coordinator and people got hurt. Danny Ello's son, Danny Jr. was his father's double right here. This film was shot on one block in Bedford Stuyvesant. That one block got renamed Do The Right Thing Way. The only street in the history of New York City named after a movie. Well, we got to show that, number one, South St. Pizzeria is on, on the corner of the block, directly opposite the Korean fruit and vegetable stand. So the fracas spilled out 
from south and pizzeria to the street. So we had to show the block getting involved. Fight! Fight! Okay! We wanted to start down and, and crane up so you could see the block. And this becomes a brouhaha. Ozzy trying to talk some sense. The love hate rings, which is a homage to Night of the Hunter. Robert Mitchum had him tattooed on his fingers. Now the cops come. Now we've already seen these two cops already. That's Rick on the left. That's Rick Allo, Danny's son. And Sandoval played the other cop, Miguel Sandoval. Now you know, if there's a fight, who are they gonna grab? So this is a very hard scene to shoot. And for 31 years, it's been a hard scene to watch. This is the Michael Stewart chokehold. And when that Eric Garner thing happened, I put in my Instagram and Facebook with my editor, Barry Brown, where we cut back and forth between Ray Raheem and Eric Garner. And it's, it's the same thing. And then when he falls, we laid the camera down on the street. So he would fall right into the lens. So hard, hard to continue talking after this scene because we, we feel in a way this call, I can breathe, that is not only acting out uh, murderous state violence, but appears also as a manifestation of structural racism and hatred, more generally, literalized in the ring, uh, that we are also seeing come back in this uh, uh, horrendous way with the coronavirus crisis and the social context in which is emerging. So what to make of also other forms of racial bias hidden for instance, behind a blind trust in technology that disregards gender and racial variances. For instance, false oximeters, a fingertip device commonly used in homes and hospitals can give false normal readings, a dangerous low level of saturations, three times more for blacks than for whites. Jameson? Um. There's also something interesting in the do the right thing, which is that the smashing of the boombox, again, a kind of object gets destroyed before then the violence erupts even further and becomes the destruction of the body. And I think there's a lot that we could say more about the technology and the technological relations here, which are embedded in the question of screens. Um, when I was working in the hospital with patients suffering from coronavirus, what was apparent as a psychoanalyst was that difficulty breathing made patients, but also doctors and staff equally anxious, which inevitably affected medical care. The anxiety was exacerbated by the fact that knowledge about the virus was evolving in the midst of an unfolding crisis and the state was obviously overwhelmed. But what this led to in the hospital was harsh vocalized threat, the rush to rely on controversial intrusive procedures from over-medicating patients with sedatives and to unnecessary forms of intubation. So if we take everything that we've talked about today with the kind of erogenous aspects of breathing to the question of trauma and birth and superegoic forms of asphy asphyxiation, um, could we say that we are seeing the superego rear its head in response to the anxiety provoked by this erogenous zone? As the pandemic progresses and after many trials and error, we're learning that most patients did not survive after being placed on mechanical ventilation. 
for acutely infected patients, intubation, which was already a risky procedure with a high mortality rate of up to 88% was in fact done quite prematurely, which was anticipated by pulmonologists because patients in fact with coronavirus um, can have very low oxygen levels and are still able to breathe. You have to ask yourself a question here. Was this an anomaly of the coronavirus? Was this just us trying to catch up with knowledge? But could there also be in this a parapraxis or even a symptom? Does looking at these films, obviously quite before coronavirus, show us something of what this symptomatic kind of parapraxis is? And also, what does it mean that breathing and smell, loss of smell uh, for patients with COVID, uh, are returning, maybe returns of the repress in the 21st century? In essence, breath can become a symptomatic expression of maybe an aversion or fear in relation to life or errors, an expression of the intergenerational transmission of the death right via the superego. In its erogenous form, is it an expression of sexual desire that cannot be expressed as such because it implies over proximity and overexposure to the confusion and excitement of the primal scene? Can we take a breather and put on a more sublimatic object between us and the death drive? Do we need to maybe invent a different type of screen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia and Jameson. Wow, so many questions and so many very rich, really dense ideas. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that we can really get a chance to have a look at some of them and unpack them in the discussion, but we are gonna move straight on to the next paper. And, um, and this is presented to us by Miles Link. And Miles, um, is going to give us a paper entitled Crying on Screen. So we move from breathing to crying. Um, Miles received his PhD in English Literature from Trinity College in Dublin in 2014. He has taught literature at third level for 10 years in Dublin and in Shanghai. He is currently enrolled in the MSc in Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy at St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin and it is information as a psychoanalytic psychotherapeutic practitioner. He is originally from, from your town, Patricia. He's from Philadelphia. Thank you, Miles. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers for, um, for uh, allowing me to um, talk a little bit. I'd like to talk um, a little bit about this experience of um, crying or weeping in reply to a work of art. Um, um, because I think there's something that's kind of strangely honest about that act. Um, honest in the sense that it has the flavor of a kind of truth, um, but strange because it's also hard to locate where the, that truth actually lies. And um, you will see very quickly where the screen aspect comes into this. Um, so I'd like to start by, by way of exploring a scene from book eight of the Odyssey. Um, so there, Odysseus, shipwrecked after his departure from Calypso, is cared for by King Alcinous and the Phaeacians. Um, at a banquet, uh, the bard Demodocus sings a song about the Trojan War, about an argument between Achilles and Odysseus himself, who, upon hearing the song, is overwhelmed. and He covers his face with his cloak to weep. So there's the screen. Um, it's worth reading through the passage and I do have slides, so I'll just um, attempt to uh, bring that up here. Here we go. Um, I hope you can see that okay. So here's the, here's the relevant passage. Odysseus's strong hands clutched his long purple cloak, pulled it above his head and hid his handsome face. He felt ashamed to let Phaeacians look at him with tears streaming from his eyes. So every time the godlike minstrel paused in his song, Odysseus would wipe away the tears, take his two-handled cup, and pour out a libation to the gods. But then when Demodocus started up again, 
urged to sing by Phaeacian noblemen enjoying his song, Odysseus would cover up his head once more and groan. He concealed the tears he shed from all those present, except Alcinous, the only one who noticed, since he sat beside him and heard his heavy sighs. So here is a man who is traveling incognito, who hears a song about himself, his past self, uh, and he is overcome with a kind of grief. Um, from the text, it's not immediately clear what about the song is moving Odysseus to tears. At any rate, we can at least make a distinction between his weeping and his screening himself. The one is in response to the song, the other is in response to his shame. Uh, the song, meanwhile, is described as being sung well. But does that mean that Odysseus weeps because the song is truthful? Is it so close to his experience, such an artful imitation of reality, that it is painful for Odysseus? Or does he weep because the song is a beautiful rendition of the truth? In other words, because it's a falsification. We might conclude from the ambiguity of Odysseus's tears here that the bard's song is a sort of artful fiction. The song is false and Odysseus's tears are true, the emanations of a private knowledge of a public untruth, a double untruth in fact, right? The war wasn't like that. And anyways, those days are long gone. If we take this reading, however, we pass over something important. This weeping scene repeats. Alcinous the king notices Odysseus's tears, politely cuts the song short, and invites the company to a series of public contests in which Odysseus demonstrates his strength and skill far and above the abilities of his Phaeacian hosts. He's then bathed, clothed, presented with copious gifts, linen, bronze, ivory, and finally wined and dined again. This time, however, he himself asks the bard to sing another song, a song about the building of that wooden horse at Troy, a scheme hatched by Lord Odysseus with his trickery. Once again, Odysseus weeps at the song, but more violently this time, uh, as a woman weeps, as she falls to wrap her arm around her husband, fallen fighting for his home and children. That's how Emily Wilson translates that passage. Again, he covers his head with his cloak. And again, Alcinous is the only one to notice Odysseus's tears and asks for the music to stop. Since our godlike minstrel was first moved to sing, says Alcinous, our guest has been in pain. His mournful sighs have never stopped. This crying business can no longer be taken as the foreign stranger's personal matter. This is now a state affair. Uh, that is, it risks the Phaeacians' reputation as good hosts to have someone constantly crying in their presence. Equally, from his side, Alcinous has tolerated this stranger's anonymity long enough. Um, he is, uh, excuse me, he is now driven by this man's strange behavior to ask for his identity. Odysseus reveals himself and tells the story of his journeys from Troy, and we get the rest of the poem. Uh, with this second scene, we once again find ourselves a bit in the dark about what exactly is moving Odysseus to tears. For one thing, the comparison of his weeping to that of a woman whose husband is slain in battle and who herself is sent off to slavery makes the grief expre expressed here far more public. Um, is Odysseus expressing a kind of remorse? Should we take this scene and the Odyssey maybe in general in line with Euripides' The Trojan Women uh, or Pat Barker's Regeneration Trilogy, right? Is this uh, the Odyssey as another long meditation on the resonating aftermath of war. Uh, perhaps. Uh, there isn't, of course, any one thing that makes Odysseus cry here. Or rather than fixating on a contextual reason, we can say there is a formal reason for Odysseus first to cry, then to live in a fantasy of personal acclaim for a day, and then to cry again. So in fact, this second scene of weeping only emphasizes more strongly this question of what here is true and false. We could say it is Odysseus's conceit, his getting wrapped up in the fantasy that prompts this second weeping episode. He's feeling so damn good that he just wants the bard to sing another song about himself and it's all clearly too much.
Uh, it's fitting then that the bard's second song is about the Trojan horse. Within the song presented in the guise of yet another gift to the surpassing man, Odysseus's grief is smuggled back in too. The song overturns everything, and as a result, Odysseus is forced to tell his story. Uh, this is all a way of saying that the bard's song reveals what Odysseus is not, both in the sense that he, a wanderer tossed literally naked onto Phaeacia's shore, is no longer the hero of war that he once was, and in the sense that he is not the figure that his conceit has dreamt up. Readers of the Odyssey are familiar with the goddess Athena's role in getting the hero home. She doesn't so much save the day as she clears a path for him. In this brief stop in Phaeacia alone, Athena guides Odysseus to Alcinous's palace. She makes him appear taller and more handsome to the Phaeacians. Um, she announces his victories over his competitors and so on. Athena here is Odysseus's self-conceit, the element of the trickster that tricks himself. The bard's song melts away all of that conceit. What I want to point to here is therefore this kind of three-part relationship, Odysseus weeping, the bard's song that shows him what he is not, and the cloak or the screen that is raised between them. When Odysseus raises the cloak and screens his own face, he is not rejecting the falsity of an artistic lie. He is avowing himself as false, as the broken remnant that remains irreconciled to the glorious version of himself in the song. So shifting from the mythic past to our pandemicized present, how are we to understand this notion that the screen covers the false? For example, don't several high profile cases of bad behavior on Zoom uh, two Irish lecturers bad-mouthing their students, a uh, masturbating New Yorker journalist, an Argentine lawmaker sucking his partner's breast, don't they all reveal precisely the opposite, uh, namely that the screen reveals what is true? Doesn't the screen invite us to disclose more of our hidden selves, safe as we feel with a medium between us, seduced into dropping our guard? Doesn't the screen expose the repressed wishes that our public presentation carefully effaces? With thoughts like these, we are again invited to make a certain valuation of true and false. But even as we assert that the screen can draw out embarrassing truths about ourselves, we insist on the unreality of the screen world. When we say that a meeting on Zoom just isn't the same as a meeting in real life, we are saying the former falls short of the latter, that it is insufficiently true. At any rate, some kind of conversion is taking place when something of ours passes through the screen. On this point, our collective re-reckoning of online life in a year of a life online often strikes me as reminiscent of the talk surrounding another small screen, uh, the small screen of television and its discourse from the 1980s. Uh, specifically, I think of a point made by George W.S. Tro, a journalist for The Atlantic, in his 1981 book, Within the Context of No Context. Tro says, the work of television is to establish false contexts and to chronicle the unraveling of existing contexts. Finally, to establish the context of no context and to chronicle it. Here is the rebuttal to the scenes of Odysseus's weeping. Rather than the screen used to cover the broken remnant, television um, unravels existing contexts all in the service of establishing false, false contexts. Specifically, says Tro, television establishes false contexts by providing an illusion of access. He says the lie of television has been that there are, no, that there are contexts to which television will grant an access. Since lies last, usually no more than one generation, television will reform around the idea that television itself is a context to which television will grant an access. In practice, uh, Tro's illusion of access here signals things like backstage broadcasts at awards ceremonies, uh, living room interviews with prominent politicians and so on. You appear to be admitted into a space reserved for the select but this admission is a mere conceit. It is champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Tro predicts that television would in the end drop the pretense that the truth abides just off stage 
and present itself as true. Today, Tro's prediction bears fruit in the urgency of the insistence that truth is on screen for the very reason that it is on screen. And so today, authorities and conspiracists grapple over whose version of the story is fake news. And it should not be forgotten, I think, that authorities threw that barb first. We suppose in all this that the screen standing between us and virtuality is the boundary line of the false. The screen is a divider. Uh, we cover our heads, Odysseus-like, we suppose, if we also assert the beautiful falsity of the bard's songs, and we turn inwards towards the true. That is why the moments on the screen in which truth seems to break through the falsity are so significant for us. We share videos of newscasters in intensive care units breaking off to weep. Uh, and nurses, doctors, and medical officials affirming the truth of the pandemic. Uh, perhaps it seems right to us in a macabre way when COVID patients must say goodbye to their families on screen, uh, right, because this is the screen reined back into a properly subservient position to the truth. Uh, just as according to the old joke, a gaffe is when a politician omits the lie, and a TV blooper is the moment when television can no longer spin its artifices. These moments, we suppose, signal the arrival of the truth on the internet. That is, truth here is expressed in the failure of the conversion. Uh, the newscaster who breaks down in tears then offers us apparently the truest moment of all. Something true has escaped into visibility by its failed conversion into the false. All of this would be to understand this process of conversion, I think, as moving between the universal and the particular in some way. Um, after all, as Tro says, um, I'm just trying to, there we go. Nothing that doesn't appeal immediately to 10 million people happens in the serious mass media business. 10 million people immediately, 50 in potential. I'm sure those numbers are uh, different today, whatever. Um, or think of face masks as a screen here, right? Todd McGowan argues in a video lecture from last year that the reason the right is so opposed to face masks is that the face mask is an assertion of a universal, that is the universality of our fragile bodies. Does that mean that Odysseus in hiding his face is hiding his particularity? As a nameless stranger, is he adopting a universalized persona? the guest who must be met with hospitality in order to fix the identity of his hosts in place. And where does that leave art? If Odysseus in his vulnerability is asserting the universality of man, does that suggest that artworks must cut across and overturn the particular and draw out the universal from it? Um, that risks, I think, the idea that art or virtual reality or fantasy is just a kind of photo negative of the world. And all we must do is invert its colors. Uh, Freud himself says that not every negative uh, necessarily becomes a positive, nor is it necessary that every unconscious mental process should turn into a conscious one. But when we say that art shows us what the world is not, that includes what the world might have been, uh, what it could be, what it is not yet. And this is what Theodore Adorno means when he says that all art um, aims to end all art. Art intends to realize the potential it embodies and to make itself superfluous. So he says, if the idea of beauty appears only in dispersed form among many works, each one nevertheless aims uncompromisingly to express the whole of beauty. Beauty as single, true, and liberated from appearance and individuation manifests itself not in the synthesis of all works, but in the downfall of art itself. That is setting aside a perhaps value laden distinction between true and false. We have arrived at the not unfamiliar metaphor of the camera obscura here. That is Odysseus's screen really establishes not just a division, but an inversion. Um, as Sarah Kaufman notes, the passage from the unconscious to the conscious, from darkness to light, entails an ordeal, a test, and this is always a showdown of sorts. 
Um, to say that art shows us what the world is not is simply to point out an opposition or conflict. Um, art works not just in conflict with, with each other, um, as Adorno says, over the expression of beauty, but with their audience too, shuffling up all of those undeveloped negatives. Adorno calls our encounter with this inversion, this encounter with art that overturns everything we thought we knew about ourselves. Uh, he calls it the aesthetic shudder. Um, really arresting phrase. The aesthetic shudder rescues subjectivity by the negation of subjectivity. If in artworks the subject finds his true happiness in the moment of being convulsed, this is a happiness that is counterposed to the subject and thus its instrument is tears, which also expresses the grief over one's own mortality. One last example might illustrate this process of inversion and I'm sure to everyone's relief, uh, wouldn't you know it, it's a film. Um, in Fritz Lang's 1945 film, Scarlet Street, um, Edward G. Robinson plays a bank clerk and a hobbyist painter um, who is conned by Joan Bennett and her shiftless boyfriend, Johnny. Uh, by chance, Robinson's paintings are discovered by the world of high art, but the boyfriend passes them off as Bennett's, launching her to fame. When she finally rejects Robinson, he murders her and pins the deed on the boyfriend who is tried and executed. The guilt for his deed drives Robinson to a life on the streets where in the final scene, he witnesses the so-called self-portrait of Bennett that he had painted being sold for $10,000 and being carried off from a high-end art gallery as he hears Bennett's whispered cry in his head, I love you, Johnny. Scarlet Street is a weird second take on The Woman in the Window from the year before, another Fritz Lang film featuring Robinson staring longingly at a portrait in a gallery window. Uh, Zizek notably discusses that film as an instance of a man awakening from his dream to escape the real of his desire. That is his dream of meeting, seducing and killing the woman in the portrait. Uh, here in Scarlet Street, as the portrait is carried out in front of Robinson, the painting's subject, this artist who never existed, is born in truth as the synthesis of his painting and her persona. Neither the shabby con artist couple nor, de, nor the uh, hobbyist painter could have created the work alone. And it stands for an existence a reconciliation that neither could attain separately. As it is carried out of the gallery, the portrait is literally a screen between Robinson and the empty streets where ahead of him lie only obscurity and death. So finally, let's just consider the parallels between this scene and the scene of Odysseus weeping. A broken and remorseful man faced with a desolate and uncertain prospect is confronted by an artwork emanating from his own past. One that as if in, by inverting his whole life in a camera obscura, reveals all the things he could have been, but was not, all the things he will be, but is not yet. One last quote from Adorno, and I'll finish, um, who, and he's, in this quote, he's discussing Schubert's Winterreise, um, says, this is precisely what in art evokes tears from us. He says, we cry without knowing why, because we are not yet what this music promises for us. We cry knowing in untold happiness that this music is as it is in the promise of what, will, of what one day we ourselves will be. This is music we cannot decipher, but it holds up to our blurred over brimming eyes, the secret of reconciliation at long last. Or perhaps like King Alcinous, we sit beside all of this and hear another's cry in sympathy. So uh, that's all from me, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Miles. That was so fascinating, so interesting. Uh, a million other really incredibly complex questions. Um, I, I have no idea how the shape of this discussion is going to go, but uh, we, we will need, we'll, we'll press on. We'll introduce Robert Kilroy now. Um, Robert is, his, the title of his talk is Zooming with Freud, Screen Contagion in the Shadow of COVID-19. 
And I should mention that this is a presentation which um, is somewhat taken from uh, a recent article which he has published in Le Kunai, um, which we can put details of, of, of that um, on the chat. Um, Robert has a PhD from Trinity College Dublin for a thesis which reevaluates the visual, verbal, and curatorial practices of the artist Marcel Duchamp using a revised interpretation of Lacanian theory, engaging directly with the work of Zizek whose approach to images he critically examines, Robert is calling for a parallax approach to the study of art and visual culture based on a renewed engagement with art historical tools. He has published widely on the triangulation of psych psychoanalytic theory, art history, and visual studies, as well as the evolving role of the digital in contemporary culture. His most recent book, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, 100 Years Later, published by Palgrave in 2017, draws out the essential coordinates of a theoretical encounter between Duchamp and Lacan. His current research focuses on fully developing this conceptual and methodological framework by looking specifically at the question of modern and contemporary art in the context of a global art history. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Robert, over to you. Thanks, Carol. And thank you to the Irish Film Festival and APPI, IFPP, and Marie, Barbara, Sarah, Eve Watson for, for having me here. It's a great privilege to be, to be speaking amongst such esteemed um, company. So um, I should begin maybe by saying that I'm approaching the question of the screen, not as a practicing psychoanalyst, but as um, Carl outlined, more of a, a psychoanalytic theorist who is orientated towards the question of iconology, uh, art history, aesthetics. Um, I'm currently working in the field of modern and contemporary art where I'm focusing on reigniting the, the aesthetic uh, core of, of Lacan's conceptual model. And as a catalyst, I combine um, Zizek and Duchamp um, to try to make sense of what I'm now referring to as screen contagion, uh, something I'm trying to uh, take seriously in uh, using a psychoanalytic, um, iconological and epidemiological approach, if possible, based on um, the fact that we're all a bit more uh, grounded in epidemiology than we used to be. Um, so this paper was written as an article during lockdown. Um, on, I was on a, in an apartment on the 34th floor of a tall skyscraper in the Middle East. Um, and it came about as a response to a seminar given by Danny Nobus at the Freud Lacan Institute uh, entitled Psychoanalytic Practice in the Technological Space. In his talk, Nobus posed two very interesting and very important questions. Firstly, how does the image of the analyst develop in computer mediated technology? And secondly, what happens when the analyst disappears from the physical space only to be replaced by the more tangible presence of the screen? So the working thesis that I'm hoping to develop is that COVID-19 is itself uh, a symptom in a purely Lacanian sense of a more insidious shadow pandemic that is operating in the background of the current public health crisis. And I'm referring here, of course, to the creeping encroachment of screens into every aspect of our lives, an issue which thankfully today we're able to directly address through the prism of uh, cinema. I'll just quickly try and share, I just have a few short slides. Um, if I can. So um, Ian Parker makes the important point, which I look forward to hearing him develop later, that in order to understand how psychoanalysis speaks to us about film, we need to focus both on the question of content and form. Now, this immediately places the analyst on an aesthetic footing, where the charged effect of motif, texture, composition are all central concerns, as well as notions of beauty, truth, fiction, um, as so demonstrated so well by Miles just before me. So from within this domain, psychoanalysis, as we know, offers a radically alternative toolbox of methods. At the same time, the exchange with cinema raises the possibility that psychoanalysis is woven into the phenomenon it studies, film, television, fundamental question of images, precisely because it emerges from that phenomenon. This is a, an idea I don't have time to elaborate here, 
what it essentially refers to what I'm calling, what Zizek might call the parallax relationship between cinema and psychoanalysis that I believe goes right to the heart of um, the relationship between art, psychoanalysis and aesthetics. With all this in mind, I'm going to attempt now to try and examine the subjective and social shifts we're all currently experiencing by looking at three productions, uh, two big screen and one small, the first of which is the um, huge success story of lockdown, the Irish television series, Normal People. Um, it was perhaps such riveting viewing because the challenges faced by the two main protagonists, Connell and Marianne, appeared so normal, so common to us all. They're unable to find a place in the world. They become emotionally paralyzed by a debilitating sense of anxiety. The psychoanalyst might recognize here an encounter with the real, a void of subjectivity, the impenetrable. But the normal in normal people is distinctly new. And we know this because of the key structural element an invisible mediator guiding Connell and Marianne's actions, which is subtly indicated throughout the series. And I'm referring here, obviously, to the, the barely perceptible but ubiquitous presence of the smartphone and the computer screen. Appearing regularly, visible out of the corner of the viewer's eye, the screen is a key plot device which makes a, si a very singular point clear. Connell and Marianne are digital natives whose uneasy disposition is a mark of their emigration from online platforms onto a real social network that to them appears foreign and thus all the more difficult to navigate. But what is a digital native in psychoanalytic terms? And what are the broader socio-symbolic shifts framing Connell and Marianne's lived experiences? One of the first notable reactions to the pandemic was a resurgent interest in outbreak movies, such as Steven Soderbergh's Contagion. There was one film that garnered less attention, um, Daniel Espinosa's 2017 Skyfi Life, uh, which I think is worth discussing. It, it tells the story of a space crew who discover life on Mars in the form of a dormant cell they, they named Calvin, only to see it grow in size and hostility. And the film is organized around a repeated uh, plot device, a kind of syst the systematic manner in which it's like the crew members themselves accelerate the growth of the alien organism through their urge to intervene and help endangered colleagues. So the movie effectively stages the problematics of empathy, uh, how the individual impulse to intervene and act collectively can actually fuel an impending threat. Of course, there are obvious parallels here with COVID-19. Much like Calvin, it spreads by feeding off our basic need for direct social contact. Essentially, the virus grows more deadly the more we interact and engage. But in life, the film, this alien enemy spreads by actually anticipating the behavior of the crew members in advance. In other words, the human instinct to connect becomes a limitation that is the enemy exploits. And we're reminded here, I think, of the surplus logic of global capitalism as described by Zizek. He writes that capitalism survives only by transforming its limit, its fundamental impotence into a source of power. The idea that the coronavirus might illuminate the viral dimension of capitalism is explored more fully by the Zizekian scholar Matthew Flissfader in his reading of the 2019 uh, Oscar-winning black comedy, Parasite. For, for Flissfader, the message in this film in which a family living in poverty, the Kims, infiltrate a wealthier household, the Parks, uh, he believes that it goes far beyond the simple notion of the poor feeding off the rich. For Flissfelder, it describes rather the capitalist system itself, which, much like a parasite, exhausts and devours global resources, leaving people to fight amongst, them, amongst themselves for basic needs. Now, building on this analysis, I'd like to highlight the structural similarities between parasite and life. Like Calvin, the Kims take advantage of the Park family's human weakness, the blind trust that they place in strangers. They then feed off their insecurities, their need to keep out external threats. By orchestrating a series of elaborate scenarios, the Kims ensure the removal of the existing household staff. They then present themselves in the role of replacements. But this is where I think the properly parasitic logic of capitalism becomes clear through the lens of cinema. We have an inherent tension that is identified, amplified, and transformed into a source of power. And when we look back at Parasite now from the perspective of 2020, we're struck by its remarkable prescience. Retroactively, it appears 
uncanny, uh, to use Patricia's words. And it's not for obvious reasons. When we look a little closer, we see that there are, strike, there are elements of this movie that are strikingly COVID-esque. The way Mrs. Park asks obsessively if her driver has washed his hands. On another occasion, she covers her face with a mask. And there's a scene showing a housekeeper coughing into a bin, which reverberates with uh, COVID connotations. As we watch all of these instances build up, we begin to notice an overarching trend. The Park family's anxieties are all rooted in questions of health and hygiene. Indeed, the film seems to depict the new normal described by Zizek in his 2020 book on the pandemic. An increased fear of a more contaminated other who threatens to infect the clean, hyper-sanitized space of our closed, protected existence. But what Zizek does not fully elaborate, I would argue, is the mediated nature of this sanitized space. In Parasite, the crucial point is that the series of health crises are carefully choreographed performances which are designed a bit like a Trojan horse to gain access to the host. The real parasite in essence spreads on the back of a medical crisis. And this is the, the central idea behind what I'm calling screen contagion. Lockdown, as we know, did nothing to subdue the key catalyst in the spread of COVID-19, the human instinct for connection. And big tech has capitalized on this situation feeding off our innate need for social interaction. It has done so by, I think, harmonizing the paradox at the center of this, center of this crisis. The impossible idea that we can only truly come together by remaining apart. Like the Kim family, the screen now presents itself as the cure to the very problem it creates. As we rely more and more on screens as sources of entertainment and interaction, it's very easy to forget the direct correlation between screen use and mental health issues that dominated public discourse before the pandemic struck. It's worth emphasizing here, I think, the, the almost fetishistic, excessive nature of the recent backlash against big tech um, for all our condemnation of figures like Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, um, for the mass obscene amounts of wealth that they've, they've uh, made during this crisis, 63 billion, I think, was how much uh, Bezos has made in the last year. I think it hides a certain traumatic truth. The obscene sums of wealth themselves are, are in fact a direct reflection or an external embodiment of our own excessive levels of engagement, something we're not quite um, fully willing to acknowledge. So I think this is how cinema can shed light on our current predicament by communicating its content forcefully at the level of its form. The films I've referred to are marked by features that appear somewhat out of place in Congress as if they disrupt rather than contribute to the film's deeper underlying message. In normal people, as I said, the, it's a constant reference to screen use. In Parasite, the smartphone is a, is a particularly key plot device. And as Lacan said about the anamorphic stain in Holbein's ambassadors, such unusual symptomatic distortions are designed to shed light on the formal operations at work on the surface of the image the compositional texture of the interface itself. The maneuver provoked by these films is fundamentally Freudian, a disengagement from sign signification that allows for an increased focus on the primary processes of displacement and condensation playing out on the surface of the interface. And it's through this effect, which I think is perfectly illustrated by the cracked screen and black mirror, that psychoanalysis may be woven into film. Cinema forces us to recognize how our practice, the formal conditions of our own libidinal investment in screens is part of the content represented on screen. And I think actually Black Mirror's most recent film, Bandersnatch does this, or clarifies this message very well. It makes it clear as you're watching it that like a video game, we are central protagonists in the story being told through our direct engagement with the screen, which is on screen. So this might be possibly a type of psychoanalytic core at the heart of cinema. How could we define the cinematic conditions of psychoanalysis? If I return now to Danny Nobis's seminar, uh, the basic point that he was making was that the analyst shift to online platforms raises a whole range of questions relating to the conditions of the clinical encounter. In what he calls computer mediated analysis or CMA, the patient can for the first time exert an influence over the structuration of their own space. And this gives rise to a number of disruptions that interfere with the analytic process. As with anamorphic cinema, 
the analyst is confronted with a series of distortions that subvert the smooth process of interpretation. One might argue that the classic Freudian response here would be to focus not on overcoming these interferences, but rather on the structural mechanisms they reveal. In a purely cinematic sense, the obstacles that appear to block the unconscious from speaking, the loss of control over spatial coordinates, the very physical presence of the screen, become readable in a new way, as points where the unconscious actually manifests itself in the form of a blockage. Now, this takes us directly to Lacan's uh, seminar, The Four Fundamental Concepts, what might be said to mark the culmination of his efforts to circumscribe the topology of the unconscious by remapping dream analysis into a, an optical model, which he gives form to this, this double triangular schema. Um, this simple schema could perhaps shed light on the spatial coordinates of the new digital environment that structures the patient's symbolic identity. What Lacan calls the relationship between the subject and the picture. In other words, in curating our own environment on screen, we are in effectively performatively, performatively presenting ourselves as a picture under a particular gaze. So I've run out of, I'll stop sharing. Um, so the cinematic aspect of psychoanalysis sheds light, could shed light on the broader socio-symbolic order that frames Connell and Marianne's reality. I just see myself on screen, got a shock. So the crucial question we might ask, how is our new relationship to screens affecting the, our relationship to the other's gaze? Zizek sees COVID-19 as presenting the conditions for real revolutionary change. A transformation, he writes, in the way we are orientating our lives. Now, in the initial stages of the pandemic, I think that this point was valid. Masks, Zizek argues, uh, by localizing the gaze as a site of abysmal or noble desire, force us to directly confront the real. But I think what Zizek overlooks uh, and this is most obvious at the end of his book where he, he calls for um, liberation revolution through direct engagement with screens. Something which I is symptomatic in Zizek's writing, I've written about it elsewhere, uh, an excessive engagement with media which reveals an inconsistency in his, his theoretical approach. Um, he ignores in essence the, the parallel process of digital masking that we're all experiencing. On the one hand, we've become increasingly aware of our bodies our physical presence, sense of touch, smell, our relationship to objects, surfaces, and people. At the same time, we've become bodiless, passive consumers of screens, zooming directly into other people's lives and streaming endlessly looping content. So the overall overwhelming presence of the other is effectively counteracted by an extreme effect of dematerialization, a disorientating feeling of temporal and spatial contraction and compression which stretches the opposition between our online and offline existences to its absolute limit. I believe it's this heightened tension, this experience of pure radical negativity that actually could define this current moment. What is most concerning, if we use Lacanian terms, is the way the relationship between the real and the imaginary is becoming interdependent rather than oppositional. The gaze as objet petit a no longer actually appears where fantasy breaks down as a structural inversion of the object goal into the object cause of desire. It now erupts as a heightened mediated social antagonism, which may support the framework it's supposed to subvert. And what I mean by this in more basic terms is that the more firmly the online fantasy takes hold, the more intense the offline disruption, the more anxious, violent and aggressive it becomes. So we're in this kind of truly vicious self-perpetuating loop where excessive explosions of raw violence uh, drive an ever deepening engagement with the screen that mediates and alleviates that antagonism. Mm. A key concept which illuminates this shift and in the process exposes the, the true nature of the echo chambers we're now inhabiting is Lacan's description of symbolic identification as a twofold process. He writes that in phase one, a man may consider himself as belonging to a particular group, for example, in the, rank, the ranks of the proletariat. But it is only by joining a general strike, Lacan argues, in stage two, that this identity is actually realized. And I think this twofold process could be seen to underpin our entire digital existence. First, if you think about it at the level of our imaginary identity, we see ourselves, we think of ourselves in a particular way, we would like to be seen a particular way by others. 
but it's only by performatively inscribing the self-image in a structured symbolic framework, a social network, under the presupposed gaze of a more intensely personified big other, a particular idealized imaginary audience with whom we can identify our, our followers, that we realize this identity. So it's fully realized in practice by being acted out. And this is perhaps the key to understanding the, the recent Trump phenomenon. Like the worker who joins a strike, someone can identify themselves as a Trump supporter on or through social media. But in order to achieve this identity or realize this identity, they must actively attend a rally or cast a vote. What is most worrying is that, um, and this is demonstrated by the recent breach of the US Senate, that these performative acts uh, are becoming more extreme. At the same time, they're becoming more difficult to identify. Before COVID, such outbursts of raw antagonism and violence were explicitly marked by reflex, reflexive references to the screen, performative appeals to, on, to the online world. But there is a concern now that with post-COVID, these performative acts may lose their, lose their symbolic force. In other words, the gaze for whom the subject is performing, the virtualized other imagined by the subject in the field of social media may become more difficult to identify. And I think that it's in this terrifying sense, just to conclude, that not unlike the su supposed origins of COVID-19, the virus, in a sense, is jumping from the virtual to the social, expanding its reach at the level of what you might call a digitalized subjectivity, in fact, which in fact is infecting the social body eroding its institutional and ethical foundations. It's in this sense, I think, that the, the very um, important um, sentence, I can't breathe, can be applied possibly the level of the individual, but also at the level of the social body. If we think of the social body as um, being unable to breathe, it, it opens up a whole new kind of set of questions. This creeping expansion, this, the, with this creeping expansion, the, the intersubjective space begins to appear a little bit more foreign, ever more disconcerting, thus driving the subject's return to his native land. And it could be in this strange new world that we may all begin to fully identify with, with Connell and Marianne. I'll leave it, so I'll leave it there. I think that's just um, an overview, as I say, of uh, an article that was published in more detail and more depth, if you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, all four of you. Uh, as everybody no doubt has noticed, with um, no matter how well we try to time these things, we've gone over, but it's fine because nobody's going to throw us out of the Zoom at the end of the meeting. Um, so uh, I know, though, that we are under a little bit of pressure because Patricia has to literally just fly away uh, very, very quickly for another event. Um, but can we just kick off this uh, discussion, please? Um, of this incredibly rich panel. Um, I will just immediately open it up to the floor. Um, I have some, you know, 